Our last presentation of the first half of this day is from Elizabeth Davenport, and Dr. Davenport is mentored by Dr. Joseph Malgen of Neuroradiology, and her presentation is MEG, Low Frequency Brain Waves, Increase After a Season of High School Football. This obviously is the capital high school football, so this should be quite fascinating. Come join us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, yeah, it's going to be a turn from the earlier presentations today. So I have no disclosures. The purpose of this study is to determine if the cumulative effects of head impacts from a season of football produce magnetoencephalography or MEG measurable changes in the brain in the absence of clinically diagnosed <coughs> concussion. We recruited 24 male high school football players from a varsity high school football team ranging from 16 to 18 years of age. None of the players included in this study had a history of concussion or concussion during the season, nor did they have a history of neurologic disease. They all had pre and post season MRI and MEG imaging and their impacts were measured using helmet embedded sensors or the HIT system during all practices and games. In addition, a certified athletic trainer was on the field during all practices and games to help identify concussion. And again, those players who had concussions were excluded from this analysis. So the HIT system consists of six accelerometers or sensors that fit within a natural gap in the helmet padding. Ooh, sorry. Right there. And these measure linear and rotational acceleration. They're spring-mounted, so they always remain in contact with the head, which is important for measuring head acceleration, not helmet acceleration. This data is correct, collected wirelessly for every game in practice, including video monitoring, so we can take out any extraneous impacts like dropping of a helmet. Um, and when processing this data, we have to be careful of comparisons. Just like snowflakes, not all impacts are created equal based on the location, the timing, the magnitude, 500 impacts for one player are not equal to 500 impacts for another. So if we weight the data based on magnitude, timing, et cetera, then the data will be very different. And this is where risk-weighted cumulative exposure, or RWE, becomes helpful. RWE is a metric that quantifies the risk of concussion associated with each impact for each player summed over the entire season. It takes into account not only the number of head impacts, but also the severity of the head impacts. We can break this down into the linear component of the acceleration, the rotational component of the acceleration, so a boxer punch or accelerating in your Ferrari, if you have one, um, or the combined probability of both. From an imaging standpoint, what this gives us is one single number representing the biomechanical data over the entire season for each player. And we compared RWE to magnetoencephalography, or MEG data, during this study, which is a non-invasive form of functional brain imaging. Similar to EEG, it detects small magnetic fields on the femtotesla scale in the brain created by neurons using the 275 sensors depicted here by the green dots. All the players received pre- and post-season resting state, eight minutes, eyes open scans using the 275 channel CTF whole head system. And this is an example of the raw data that we get off of that system. So during processing that data, we are looking specifically for delta waves. Delta waves are waves with a one to five hertz frequency, one hertz sine wave repeating one time in one second, and a five hertz sine wave repeating five times in one second. Injured brain tissue can produce these low frequency signals in the delta band, and this has been seen in military and civilian patients with traumatic brain injury. And this has also been seen in normally developing youth, but it decreases with age, so you grow out of your delta waves. So in order to extract these delta waves, we had to perform some signal processing as well as spatial processing. The first step in our signal processing was line filtering at the 60 hertz and its harmonics to remove any line noise from electronics or lights, and then automated artifact correction for jaw clenches, eye blinks, any sort of muscle artifact. And then we high pass filtered to remove biologic noise like heart rate, and then low pass filtered to remove any environmental noise. We then band pass filtered to the delta range, to the range that we're interested in for this study. And then for spatial registration, we 
analyzed the subject's MRI to MNI space and registered the MRI, the native MRI to the MEG space using the fiducial space in front of the trachis and then one on the nasion. So now we have a map from MEG to subject MRI to normalized MRI and back. Using this, we can use algorithms and those registrations to map from sensor space to brain space. The output being a 4D file in MNI space representing the delta spectrum amplitude map. The voxel values here represent the average number of delta waves across scan time. Instead of doing a voxel-wise comparison where we're comparing voxel 1 to voxel 1 in each subject, we compared the number of abnormal voxels. This gets around the heterogeneous nature of the head impacts in the players. In order to do this, we calculated the z-score using the postseason minus the preseason of each player's delta spectrum map compared to the group statistics. We then thresholded at greater than two standard deviations and did a cluster threshold of greater than one milliliter of contiguous volume, which is to avoid false positives or noise. Um, this gives us a total number of the abnormal voxels computed for each subject. So we, again, we, ha we have one number representing the abnormalities and delta um, waves in the brain. We compared the abnormal delta voxels to the RWE score, our biomechanics score, using a linear regression. And here you can see that the greater the exposure to head impacts, the greater we see that they have or the more abnormal delta voxels that they have. This gave us a pretty high R squared of around 0.34, and we had a, P, a significant p-value of around 0.01. So in conclusion, we demonstrated that a single season of football can produce changes in the brain delta wave activity detectable by Meg in the absence of clinical concussion. And with that, I'd like to thank all of our funding sources and you for your attention. Thank you. Questions for Dr. Davenport. Uh, Dr. Matry. Uh, great presentation, thank you. I just wanted to know in your ZMAP threshold of two standard deviations, had you previously done any uh, investigation about what the best cutoff was with an ROC analysis? We did not do, we've done, we did an ROC analysis, but we also did a um, analysis of anywhere from 0.5 to 4, and this threshold, the it, the significance held holds for all of those thresholds. It did, I don't so, know. So that. was two standard deviations the, the most accurate selection cutoff point between distinction of those who had the uh, delta waves from those who did not? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Dr. Yeah, so can you go back to your um, correlation graph? One slide. Oh, sure. So, yeah, this one? Yeah. yeah. So f first, unrelated to this, do the sensors give you a temporal component so that you can calculate force? Or is it strictly displacement? So what it gives us is it gives us acceleration, but we don't have any sort of... Well, acceleration will have time, right? Right, but we don't have any sort of mass to go with that. So we don't, we don't know what their hit, like we don't know the mass of the other players or anything. So we just know acceleration. And looking at this correlation, if you take out that single dot at 1.5, sure, what would happen to your correlation? It holds. That's a popular question. So, and we did look at outliers. Um, we did a Cook's D analysis for any sort of outliers. I mean, it seems to me that the slope would. Well, maybe that's just a visual. The math says your p is still below 0.05, right? Yes. That's what kids do. So did you do an analysis by position? We have not yet. The, when we did this analysis, we only had one quarterback. So that's not really enough data to get the Well, power. quarterbacks are a different breed. <laughs> <laughs> we shouldn't really count they, they, them. They don't, you know, they don't get hit that much. So, right. But seriously, I mean, you might expect a correlation by position. We, yes, we, we want to do that very badly. And so as we collect more data, so we only had two years of data, and a lot of the players played the same and so we're waiting to collect more data to do the player position analysis, and that's something we're looking forward to. Yeah, and one final question. I know sure. it's not a subject for what you're doing, for the work that you're doing here, but if this data were made available to the parents, what do you think their choices would be? 
about playing? I know that some of them don't care. Um, when asked, they don't care. Um, because this is college scholarships. Um, and some of them, the players, for the players, it's very cathartic to get out there. And, and they think that without football, their grades would slip because they wouldn't have an outlet for the stress or the energy that they have otherwise. So I think it would be a mixed review, definitely. I have one question. Sure. But ha have you looked at other data, or do you have any plans to look at other techniques such as resting state fMRI in these kids? Yes, yeah, so we have looked at resting state fMRI. <clears throat> we have publications on DTI as well as DKI. Um, we've looked at the youth analysis. So we have a group of youth players rather than the high school varsity players. Um, and we're looking, we're trying to push those out as quickly as I can write them. And Dr. Malgin can edit them. <laughs> it's critical data. I, 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 in fact, I just read an article <clears throat> this weekend in the Washington Post on this very issue, and some of the proteins are actually going to non-helmeted practices to try to yes. avoid, exactly. So this is very relevant research. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you.